All right, hello everyone and welcome to our sixth episode this season of Space Law Webinars at the Law, Technology and Warfare Research Cell at the U.S. Air Force Academy. I'm Major Matt Ormsby and I'm pleased to bring you another webinar on space law and policy this morning. For our sixth, sixth webinar of the, set of the season, we're very excited today to welcome Dr. Vian Erlonk. Dr. Erlonk is coming to us from South Africa where he's a full professor of law at Northwest University teaching space law um, and cyber law. He presents sessions on various areas of space law at the annual Gujarat Air and, and Space Law Academy held at Gujarat National Law University. He's also been involved in and taught at the launch of the space law program at Tulane University. He's a member of the International Institute of Space Law, as well as a fellow of the European uh, Law Institute he was awarded the prestigious von Humboldt Research Fellowship for Experienced Researchers, hosted by Professor Dr. Stefan Hoba at the Institute for Air and Space Law uh, and Cyber Law at the University of Cologne in Germany. His research interests and publications include aspects of property law, space law, virtual world law, cyber law, and social media law. He usually brings a focus on how property and property law function in new and unexpected environments, such as cyberspace and outer space. Today, he'll speak with us about rights to terrain and in situ resources in outer space through a lens of space treaty law and traditional property law principles. As we go along, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the box and we'll try to reserve time at the end to answer all of them. Dr. Erlonk, Thank you so much for being with us today. At this time, I'll turn it over to you, uh, let you begin your presentation. Uh, thank you again for being with us and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Major Olmsby, for those kind words. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon and evening. The exact applicability of each depends, of course, on where you are located around the globe. For me, it's six o'clock in the evening in South Africa. Thank you for this great opportunity to present some thoughts to you on the topic of today, which is the non-appropriation principle in outer space. Is it still relevant? Today, I will provide a cursory overview of one of the foundational aspects of property law as it applies to and in outer space, the so-called non-appropriation principle. From this flows a long developing debate about the recognition and or prohibition of both public and private property rights in outer space. Whereas the property rights in outer space is derived from the principle of sovereignty, private property rights are tied to the concept of ownership. Before engaging with the topic in more detail, it is important to note that the development of and the de facto legal position of property in outer space has been governed by international law and public law, and as such has traditionally been conceptualized and discussed from this perspective. While this is not necessarily a negative thing, it has managed to stifle the emergence and proper development of a private property law legal framework. The current space law framework is based on and governed mainly by means of the five main space law instruments that these were created against the background of the Cold War between the USA and the USSR is well known, as well as the fact that the position on property in outer space was influenced by, and from the perspective of, sovereign fears and aspirations in effect at the time of negotiation. The space race, or rather a race to space, confronted everyone with a sudden possibility and probability that mankind would not be bound to earthly territories anymore and that such territories might, for the first time ever, be expanded into outer space. The fear that someone else could be the first to reach the moon and claim it as their own by means of so-called flag planting was a considerable motivating factor for the Vine nations, who were in effect just the USA and the USSR at that stage, to come to the table and negotiate a new legal regime for outer space. Therefore, the fear that someone else might reach this newfound, possibly valuable real estate, and the wider territory of outer space in general could, analogous to the situation on Earth, confer territorial sovereignty of outer space, portions of it, or the heavenly bodies on a specific state. This foreshadowed the possibility 
possibility that white nations could appropriate it for themselves to the detriment of all others. The most obvious result of such acquisition of new territory would be the right to exclude all others from it. To a large extent, the relationship between a nation and its territory and citizens is analogous to the relationship between an owner and their property. In this sense, sovereignty is equated with ownership. In private law, the right of ownership is considered to be the most important and valuable right that a person can have over their property. This right is so considerable that it is often referred to as being an absolute right. Although it is generally accepted that this absolute nature of ownership is somewhat of a legal fiction and has always been limited to some extent or another by the rights of others, society in general, as well as by means of governmental control and regulation. However, irrespective of the semantic and legal accuracy of the view of absoluteness, the right of ownership is indeed the most complete and valuable right that an owner can have over their property, thus making it near absolute. From this flows various competencies and benefits. These may differ slightly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and legal traditions such as between common law and civil law traditions. But the core competencies remain the same. Setting out from the absolute position that an owner can do anything with their property as they see fit, the generally accepted competencies are the rights to use, exploit, destroy, alienate, and to exclude others from it. In much the same way, sovereignty is very similar to ownership. This is especially the case when talking about territorial sovereignty. Hence, this mirrors the absolute nature of ownership and specifically highlights the right of exclusion. The so-called non-appropriation principle is one of the cornerstones of space law. This principle entails that there is a prohibition against the appropriation of all or part of space, as well as any celestial body, including the moon, by any country, sovereign nation state or government. This principle, like most outer space law, is a product of the dualist effects of the hopes and fears of the Cold War, as I mentioned earlier, which informed much of the international political landscape during the formative years of the fledgling field of outer space law. During this time and against this background of fear, patriotism and one-upmanship, the development and inclusion of the non-appropriation principle as a cornerstone of treaty-based international space law made sense and served the space industry and international community well for the past half century. This principle was first introduced in a binding form in the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, or as we most often refer to it, the Outer Space Treaty. However, while being a cornerstone of space law with almost universal acceptance by the international community, the non-appropriation principle has also contributed to a stagnation of debate and development concerning questions of private property rights in outer space. This in itself, did not pose much of a problem for more than 50 years since the Outer Space Treaty entered into force, since the main actors in outer space operations remained sovereign states. And due to the lack of development in the exploration and use of outer space during this period. As such, the non-appropriation principle stifled the discourse on questions concerning property, sovereignty, and ownership in outer space. Vigorous development would arguably have necessitated revisiting the non-appropriation principle sooner. However, even while accepting that the non-appropriation principle is a current applicable principle of outer space law, a growing number of authors have been questioning whether it should remain in place after the emergence of the commercial focus on space activities. The recent focus on commercialization of outer space activities and applications has breathed new life into questions regarding exploitation of the space resources, including those on and or from celestial bodies. Always have to be contentious or problematical. Recent political maneuvering by prominent spacefaring nations has underscored the need for increased research in this area.
While the catalyst for the shift away from the acceptance of the status quo set by the Outer Space Treaty cannot be attributed to one specific thing, some developments are clearly key contributing factors. Of these, the following three things stand out. Firstly, the commercialization of tra space travel was initiated by allowing a private citizen to buy a trip into outer space and to spend a stint on the International Space Station. The second was the USA shift towards making use of private industry for the provisioning of launch services. The third was a legislative move made by the USA to show their support for private commercial space exploitation with the commencement of the US Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act in 2015. Of course, these things did not occur in isolation and have been followed by numerous tangential and sequential events. More space tourists have gone to the ISS and a growing space tourism industry is now developing. The private space launch industry has grown exponentially and NASA relies heavily on private actors for launches. And other countries have followed suit with the introduction of legislation to support commercial exploitation of outer space resources for their own citizens. I mean, who would want to be left behind? These events, together with numerous other scientific and commercial endeavors, have resulted in an increase in the rate of technological and scientific developments related to space. All of this has resulted in the fact that the field of space law, as it has been practiced and developed for approximately the past 100 years since it started developing uh, at the end of the 1800s, is currently lagging behind the associated technological and societal developments, instead of keeping pace with it or even being ahead of it. The outer space actors in the past, aside from telecommunication satellite companies to a limited extent, has been nation states, governments and governmental agencies. And as such, the legal aspects of space law was suitably governed by international law in the treaties, conventions, and similar intergovernmental instruments. This situation does not, however, provide an adequate mechanism for dealing with the developing commercial space industry and the entrance of private space actors, both personal and commercial, to the outer space arena as mentioned above. By its very nature, the economic realities of private actors investing in to and operating in outer space necessitate a move away from a sole reliance on public international law and a need for inclusion of aspects of private law in such specific areas as contract, insurance, and property, to name but a few. While property aspects are found woven throughout all of the main space law conventions, the most pertinent aspects are dealt with in the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Agreement. In the Outer Space Treaty, Articles 1 and 2 set out the broad principles and positions taken regarding property, and particularly the non-appropriation principle, while Articles 6, 7, and 8 deals with state responsibility for outer space activities, the liability associated with such activities, and the obligation to retain jurisdiction and control over the space objects and personnel. Similarly, Articles 11.2 and 11.3 of the Moon Agreement are also particularly illuminating. With this in mind, the applicable sections of these articles will briefly be discussed below. And here are just specific uh, portions. The following aspects of Article 1 are of particular importance. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, and shall be the promise, uh, promise of all mankind, and there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies. The first two property aspects here denote a type of public trust the province of all mankind, and vague general references to the fact that celestial bodies must be explored and used or exploited for public benefit as well as in the public interest. These concepts do not necessarily prohibit private ownership. The third property aspect here seems to be that outer space and everything natural in it should be regarded as a type of commons 
although free access can also be regarded as an explicit curtailment of the right to exclude, while not negating other competencies of ownership, such as the rights to exploit, use, and enjoy. Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty states that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. This article, however, explicitly puts celestial bodies and outer space in the category of res extra commercium, or property that falls outside the scope of commerce. It is interesting to note that by stating this explicitly, the convention is in fact underlining the fact that these celestial bodies are in fact objects of property law. This is also the article that is responsible for the so-called non-appropriation principle. While the Moon Agreement is generally regarded as a failed treaty and as such ignored in practice, it remains of interest to prominently in research about property aspects of celestial bodies, resource use, and sovereignty. As such, Article 11.2 of the Moon Agreement provides that the Moon is not subject to national appropriation by any claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. But the most important aspects are contained in Article 11.3, which state that neither nor shall become property of any state, international, intergovernmental, or non-governmental organization, national organization, or non-governmental entity, or of any natural person. So I left out the specific objects there with the focus on who cannot uh, acquire ownership rights. This treaty therefore slightly expands on the prohibition of private ownership by states and includes a the prohibition of private ownership by individuals. In the second section of Article 11.3, the following is also of interest from a property perspective. The placement of personnel, space vehicles, equipment, facilities, stations, and installations on or below the surface of the moon, including structures connected with its surface or subsurface, shall not create a right of ownership over the surface or the subsurface of the moon or any areas thereof. While once again underlining the fact that ownership as a right cannot result from the activities outlined above, and thus keeping in line with the non-appropriation principle of the Outer Space Treaty, it does acknowledge that the placing of, amongst others, stations and installations are allowed both on and below the surface. On the one hand, the complete absolute right of ownership is denied. But in effect, after such a station or installation has been constructed and placed in situ, whether on the surface or below it, the permanence of the attachment will confer the needed property rights in terms of factual possession and control on the state or party who owns such structure. While limited in extent and area, the state or party who is the owner of the applicable structure as a space object will be the owner of the portion of celestial real estate in all but name. However, as said above, the Moon Agreement is for all intents and purposes regarded as an ineffective and failed treaty, since the Convention has not been and is not being ratified by many of the main space-faring powers. And in fact, Saudi Arabia has just withdrawn the treaty. As such, it remains only of academic interest and should not be an obstacle to recognizing or regulating property rights in space. The definition and concept of a space object is of crucial importance to the discussion of property in outer space. While the words refer generically to any object found in space, which will include heavenly bodies and everything else one might encounter, the concept of a space object is more narrow. Unfortunately, there is no full or final definition of space object, but some indication is provided in the Registration Convention, Article 1b, which states that the term space object includes component parts of a space object as well as its launch vehicle and parts thereof. This exact phrasing is also followed in Article 1d of the Liability Convention, 
and provides us with a nice circular definition referring to itself. By inference, this is tied to the responsibility concerning such object placed on the launching state, which adds the additional understanding that a space object is something that is launched or destined to be launched into outer space. For practical reasons, this will mostly be man-made objects, but raw or natural materials that are launched into outer space from Earth, either by itself or as part of the cargo or payload should also be included in the understanding of space objects. A current workable definition of space objects would then be to focus on the requirements that such an object should be launched or destined to be launched into outer space and not already be naturally found in outer space. However, as soon as one is able to start mining, manufacturing and exploitation in outer space, such as by constructing new vehicles, bases or stations in outer space using raw materials found in outer space, the definition of a space object should probably also then include such newly man-made objects that are created in outer space, and as such lack the element of being launched. The opposite of space objects will then be everything else found in space, as well as space itself. Apart from space itself, the space law conventions refer to celestial bodies. While the exact content of what is included under the concept of celestial body has been wide ranging, the most cogent interpretation at the moment will be to consider everything that is not a man-made space object, i.e. artificially placed into space, either from Earth or in situ, should fall under celestial bodies. If one thinks of the examples of innovative applications for commercially entering into outer space, apart from satellite communications and lately private launches, the two examples that have featured heavily in discussions of property rights in outer space come from mining, processing and manufacturing opportunities on the one hand and space tourism on the other hand. With these in mind, it should be very clear for everyone that any private or commercial enterprise that is considering operating in those areas are not going to be doing it for the love of humanity, but rather for profit. Innovation and investment in space is expensive, and whoever does invest in these enterprises will need protection of the investment in addition to some kind of reward. This is where property law comes in. Referring to Bentham and Locke, Carol Rose underlines the essential argument for the protection of property interests. People will not work much without some inducement, and if there is no such inducement to labor, resources lie undeveloped and total wealth remains low. What into induces people to labor? Property does. Let people have secure property and will learn to invest their labor on the things that they own because they themselves will take the rewards. Once able to trade, they will invest even more in socially useful activities because the whole world becomes the market for their efforts. Therefore, in space as on earth, inducement to labor on new initiatives that could benefit society in general will depend on rights associated with such property. If such rights are not allocated, then people are not going to be induced to labor, and no initiatives will be undertaken to research and participate in space-related initiatives. Effectively, the resources in outer space will lie fallow, with the resultant in fact that any possible benefits, financial, technological, and societal, will be lost. Let us give the fledgling industries of space mining and tourism the benefit of the doubt and look 15 years into the future. Having spent billions of dollars on the development of the technology and actually getting to, for example, an asteroid or by that stage the moon or Mars or Europa and wanting to start extracting the minerals or operating a tourist destination, how will we explain their legal status? What are their needs from a legal perspective? to justify and protect the capital investment that they had to make to get there. What happens if they start mining an asteroid and a competitor starts mining on the same asteroid, but on a different site, possibly negating the cost benefit of the original mission? 
what happens if the planned orbital slot allocated to a space hotel is doled out to a Mala Fide competitor? And of course, who gives these companies the right to mine or to open hotels in space? Since, for the purposes of this argument, we acknowledge that ownership is not currently possible. Why then do we want to talk about property rights and especially about ownership? Why use the word appropriate? And why do we choose to draw a line in the sand and say ownership or nothing? Without going into too much detail, it boils down to the fact that it is better to have a right that has an erga omnes application or third party effect, and that can as such be enforced against third parties. In other words, having a property right, or at the very least a right that provides property-like protection, is better than having any other right to an object in space. Note here that I'm not just talking about a space object as we currently understand it. Some brief illumination here will be in order. Property rights to an object and ownership in particular will almost always be the preferred right that any person will want. The reason for this is a fundamental one. Ownership of all the rights available is still considered to be the most comprehensive of all rights even if it is mostly not considered to be as absolute a right as it was once argued. There will always be some form of limitation to what can, one can do or cannot do with one's property. Most of these limitations are imposed by society through custom, law or governance. However, in space, the limiting influence of society will be much less significant than on Earth, while other limitations will be more predominant with physical constraints being the most limiting. Still, ownership is a right that gives one the most comprehensive set of rights to an object, and this will always be the first prize. Second will be other less comprehensive property rights, usually framed in terms of providing someone with a limited property right to the property of someone else. Last in line, at least in terms of property and objects of property, are rights that one acquires from contract. In effect, in a competition between property rights and contractual rights, property rights will always be stronger and contractual rights will always be weaker. The reason for this is that property rights are accorded a higher importance by society and an owner thus benefits from so-called third-party protection, the erga omnes principle. While contractual rights apply only between the parties to the contract or the privity of contract, and do not extend to third parties. An exception to this focus on property rights stems from certain contractual or so-called new property rights that should be weak but are almost as strong as property rights. These are referred to as property-like rights or rights with property-like protection. In other words, while the rights are dependent on and derived from a contractual relationship between two contracting parties, and while ownership never passes in terms of this contract, the contractual right is imbued with strong property-like aspects. In most cases, this is derived from legislative protection that provides erga omnes application to the contract. Think of things like rental agreements where you have rent protection. Depending on the legislation, this gives the person using the object pretty much the same competencies toward the object that the property right would have had. And as such, for the purposes of using or exploiting the object, there is effectively no difference between being the owner of the object and not being ownership and other property rights discussed above. The intrepid civil pioneers, whether pioneers, colonists, tourists, tourism operators, or manufacturers, can therefore still have some sort of property right or even a property-like protection of their interests in space. Some examples that come to mind include concessions, mining licenses, prospecting rights, and certain contractual rights that could benefit from property-like protection. These rights could be derived from legislation that creates rights with property-like protection. It could even be possible that a company would be quite happy with purely contractual rights, at least while there are no infringements of the rights and limited access to space is acting as some sort of protective mechanism for current endeavors. In all these cases, a socially or societally 
the acceptable contract is made between the company and whoever the trust authority will be on earth. A, to provide a space mining operator with permission to mine, and B, to give them some sort of right to exclude others from their area of operation. In terms of space tourism, this trust authority will be responsible for the allocation of an orbital slot or allowing the construction and operation of a hotel on, for example, the moon. Whatever form such trust authority will take is unknown, but we know of the vaguely described authority mentioned in the moon agreement that is often equated with the International Seabed Authority. Having considered the issues relating to the development and needs of space-focused operations such as tourism and mining, it seems that while the initial argument was that ownership is needed to protect the company's investment in its enterprise, what is actually needed is the ability to recoup the investment in some way, for this ability to be protected and to prevent others from trespassing onto a specific area that is being exploited by a space mining operator. This is achieved by the ability to exclude others from interfering in your operation to your detriment. This could still happen if one does not use the concept of ownership, but uses concepts such as licenses and concessions. In other words, if property-like protection is accorded to the rights that companies have to mine the asteroids or operate hotels. I will not go into the question of the extremely odd view that people who stay on Earth or governments or some central authority could effectively prohibit someone from acquiring ownership in space or in a celestial object in space, even if those people or that government or authority had no means of interfering with the actual object in space. At the end of the day, if no one is there to interfere with the way in which you use something, does ownership have any meaning? If there are no sanctions to be applied if you use an object as if you are the owner, does the prohibition of calling yourself an owner have any effect? Let us also consider for a moment the possible sanctions that could be imposed on a company who operates in space as if it is the owner of celestial real estate. Who is able to prevent you from doing something or infringe on your possession? The nature of the location creates a technically environmentally enforced exclusion of others to the benefit of the user. When there is no one to stop a company from doing something, one possible way of trying to punish it will be by imposing sanctions against the purchase of its products. This is, of course, not an uncircumventable problem, as companies tend to find markets for their products even in the face of sanctions. Inertial drives and anti-gravity will change the current reasons for mining in space, but not necessarily soon enough. Even if sanctions against the purchase of space-obtained materials are put into place, then the miners will still have a de facto monopoly that will sustain their operations. This will be so, especially when the mining in outer space does not presuppose that the minerals need to be brought back down to the surface of the Earth. The benefit of mining natural resources in outer space will be in the ability to manufacture massive spacecraft and space stations in the weightless environment. This ability is ex extremely important for future developments in man's access to and use of space. Since firstly, it is prohibitively expensive to transport natural resources from the surface of the Earth into outer space. And secondly, one will not be constrained by the physical limitations placed on the construction of spacecraft on the ground. Alternatively, the imprisonment, sequestration, or winding up of the holding company on Earth and possibly military action could act as a deterrent. The problem is that if private companies are so powerful as to be able to spend the required money on getting to space, exploiting the celestial environment, and effectively bringing the much needed materials back to Earth and not necessarily down to Earth, they may also have the political as well as the technological and or military means to defend their factual position regarding their celestial property even though there is a prohibition on the placement of certain types of weapons in outer space. In other words, if we will not provide them with a legal means of exclusion, however vague that might be, from Earth, they will provide it for themselves. 
The same goes for colonists or settlers in outer space. How will we prevent them from exercising the right to self-determination to find or found a new sovereign nation on a celestial body? In one of my earlier articles called Rethinking Terra Nullius and Property Law in Space, I noted the temporary aspect of granting current ownership of a celestial body or part thereof. The temporary aspects being associated with the ability to exercise possession as well as effective control over the celestial real estate. So, however we use the word ownership, ownership effectively ends with the loss of possession or effective control over the real estate in space. This is then not very different from giving someone a concession or a license to mine the celestial real estate and revoke it again when they are finished. What is the difference between the ownership then and the concession, or ownership and possession for that matter? The company has achieved the same goals and we are not infringing on any international conventions. Let us now change tactics and argue for the recognition of at the very least limited rights of private ownership in outer space. For the same reasons listed above, companies and investors will prefer ownership rights to certain non-space objects, i.e. non-man-made objects in outer space as well as celestial bodies. But first we must ask whether a heavenly body can be an object of property law. As alluded to earlier, traditionally heavenly bodies were defined as objects of property that fell outside of commerce, i.e. res extra comercium and as such were not capable of being appropriated by private individuals. They were grouped together as part of the res communis omnium. Often the reason for something being classified as being outside of commerce was due to the requirement that something, an object, must be appropriable by people or subject to human control. Therefore, Things like free-flowing water and the air that one breathes were regarded as being outside of commerce. The same logic applied to celestial bodies since no one was able to appropriate or control a heavenly body. However, as with most things in law, there are developments and exceptions. For example, free-flowing water and the air that one breathes were clearly not subject to human control or private ownership and therefore belong to everyone. But if one were able to contain and control a specified amount or volume of the water or air, one could acquire ownership of it. The requirement for this was that the object had to be collected or removed from the general hull and subjected to human control by bottling or collecting it in a bucket or in some other form of containment. Once this was done, the water or air could be quantified was specifiable and subjectable to human control. The same argument can be extended to the reclassification of, or at least exception of certain heavenly bodies. If one can exert control over an object found in space, one should in theory be able to have some sort of recognizable property right or interest in it. Therefore, it stands to reason that at least in certain instances, heavenly bodies or objects found in space will be appropriable by man and one could vest ownership in them. Now I gather that you follow my argument here that I am ignoring the non-appropriation principle for the moment. How then should one determine if an object found in space is capable of falling inside of comets? To answer this question one would once again have to turn to the characteristics of impersonality tangibility, independence, susceptibility to control, and usefulness and value for mankind. In each and every case, one would have to apply the characteristics to the object in question and see if it could become the object of a right of ownership or of any other property right. Large celestial bodies such as the Moon or Mars can be used as an illustration of this. The Moon is indeed impersonal, it's not part of man, tangible, one can touch it if one gets there, and independent. It is not a part of man or another substantive object. Susceptibility to control by man is a problematical issue and will be discussed in more detail below. The moon is clearly of use and value to man, 
From this quick analysis, it would seem that only the characteristics of tangibility and control could lead to any more questions. The first semi-problematical issue relates to the aspect of tangibility. The question of tangibility is not always an issue of property law, and certainly in common law tradition, tangibility does not really create any issues when dealing with issues of property. However, tangibility is still an issue in many civil law jurisdictions, and I will quickly address the main issues here. For the purposes of this webinar, I assume that man is capable of reaching celestial bodies, such as the moon or Mars, and also capable of staying there for a reasonable and non-negligible period of time. Because of this, it stands to reason that if man finds himself on the surface of the moon or Mars, he or she can touch it and discover it to be tangible. As the technology to travel to and stay on these heavenly bodies is currently being refined and will surely reach a point where the problem of getting there is not an issue anymore, I do not consider this to be an issue. However, it should be noted that this will always be a factual question. If a person cannot reach a specific object in space, then it will not be considered to be tangible for the purpose of this theory. It is arguable, however, that if man can reach an object and interact with or touch it by means of a proxy, such as using a robot or remote-controlled rover, then it will still be considered to be tangible. This aspect of tangibility is extremely closely connected with the characteristic susceptibility to control by man. If one can exert control over a heavenly body or object in space, the next question is to what extent does one control it? The extent of control will determine if one can acquire ownership of a whole object or just a part of it and cannot exert control over the moon as a whole celestial object. One cannot currently shift it out of its orbit around the earth or change its shape from round to oval. Any control that one is able to exert over it will therefore be limited to certain areas on the moon. This means that no single person or institution will be able to acquire ownership of the whole of the moon, and any property rights that can be vested in or regarding to the moon will be limited in extent to that area of the moon that any one person or institution is able to exert control over. So what does this mean in real terms? It follows from the argument made above that in order for someone, and here someone denotes anyone and includes both personal and juridical persons, to be able to acquire property rights on or to a celestial body, he, she, or it will have to be able to get there and exert direct and physical control over it. This finally puts to rest all the ludicrous and opportunistic claims to heavenly bodies and objects in space made by people on Earth who have never been to the specific object and have not and cannot exert any control over the object. Therefore, according to both the absence of control as well as the requirements of the Nemoclus Juris rules, which states that one cannot transfer more rights than one has, corporations that are selling plots on the moon can never transfer ownership or title to a prospective buyer since they never had any property rights themselves. For real world purposes, if anyone was to take these sales and claims more seriously than the novelty items that they are, it would be a matter of fraud akin to someone trying to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. For the same reason, the fact that someone is the first to spot a comet or asteroid and name it will also have no legal consequence as far as the property rights to the object are concerned. If one is unable to reach the object and exert control over it, then there will be no property rights to it. This would also solve the problem of one nation or entity claiming ownership of a whole celestial body. Even though someone is able to reach a celestial object, is the first to land there and to plant a flag, this does not mean that the person, country or company will acquire any ownership or property rights to such object. The only rights that stem from such an action will be bragging rights. The next question then concerns the extent of the area or the size of a claim for property rights if one is indeed able to satisfy all the requirements mentioned above. In the days when exploration of the Earth was still a proud occupation and there was still, still such a thing as terra, igno, con, terra incognita and terra nullius, 
it was sometimes accepted that one could have ownership of a piece of property that was as large as the distance that one could travel by horse in a day. This is a very apt principle to use when trying to determine the extent of an area that is susceptible to ownership on the moon. The property can extend in any one direction only for as far as one is able to travel and return to the base camp without having to replenish air, fuel and food. Any further and one would not be able to exert control over the piece of property and claims of ownership would be superfluous. If one was to abandon a specific area or not have the need or ability to return there, the property would revert to Ray's nullius and all rights of ownership will extinguish. Even this is generous, and arguably one would only acquire ownership over the much smaller portion that is actually needed and can effectively be used and or exploited. To recap, the argument goes that if one made the investment of money or effort to get to an object in space, can exert control over it and can exclude other people from access to that object or area, then one would have ownership of the object. This is an argument that should be taken seriously due to the uninhabited and unexplored present nature of space. If one were to follow this line of reasoning, it would mean that someone would have de facto ownership of an object in space if that person was able to exert control over the object and exclude others from it. Finally, we come to the crux of the matter and return to our question at hand. The non-appropriation principle in outer space, is it still relevant? By now, you probably suspect that I'm going to answer this in a negative. However, you will be wrong. In spite of the arguments raised above, which I must admit I was only able to superficially touch on today, I do believe that the non-appropriation principle is still not only relevant, but in fact, extremely important. This does not mean that I don't believe that it should be developed or reinterpreted to keep in pace with technological developments and ever-changing societal needs. The fact is that by recognizing, properly describing and limiting private and on celestial real estate, the peaceful and productive use of outer space will be supported rather than hindered. That being said, there are two major concerns about developing and or removing the non-appropriation principle. The first is clear. If you were to accept that states could claim outer space or large swaths of it, including various celestial bodies, they would be able to exclude others and dictate terms of access to and access through outer space. This would, of course, then be a realization of the fears that led to the creation of Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty in the first place and in effect negate all the other principles and ideals of the Outer Space Treaty. On the other hand, there is a clear need for the recognition of at least private property rights to specific, limited, and effectively controlled portions of the moon, heavenly bodies, and such other naturally occurring objects in outer space that are not considered to be space objects. However, if we recognize that this is a possibility, we should clearly recognize the following indirect effect of what I like to call the sovereignty problem. Whatever the eventual resolution or evolution of the debate about the non-appropriation principle as discussed earlier, one nagging problem remains. This problem is directly related to how one views the delimitation between individual and state. It also highlights the diverging views about whether a property right can exist without the involvement, direct or indirect, of the state as alluded to above. If one follows a theory that property can only exist under authority of the state, as seen in some common law jurisdictions, the sovereignty problem becomes very clear. On the other hand, if one supports the general Roman Germanic approach that it is possible to acquire property rights without the cooperation of the state, then the sovereignty problem could perhaps be much less of a threat. The sovereign problem that I refer to here concerns the fear or possibility that a non-appropriation principle could be indirectly circumvented by states if private appropriation of property is allowed. The reasons for this are twofold. In the first case, states could appropriate celestial real estate by proxy through their citizens. In the second case, even if states have no interest in appropriating celestial real estate, the OST creates an inherent de facto situation of indirect appropriation by proxy 
due to the obligation of supervision, control, and jurisdiction over these space objects and citizens. Whereas the intention of the state might differ in the above two cases, the de facto situation remains the same. Under the current international space law regime, states cannot appropriate celestial real estate, even if we then argue that private acquisition is not prohibited and therefore should be allowed in terms of Article 2, the requirement of perpetual supervision and control and jurisdiction of space objects and personnel would mean that if private acquisition of property were to take place, extraterritorial jurisdiction is automatically and mandatorily extended to the applicable launch state. This position is untenable. In conclusion, current international space law prohibits national appropriation of celestial real estate. Furthermore, there is an obligation on states to exercise jurisdiction, authorization, and control over their space objects and personnel. By exercising such control, states will be indirectly, intentionally, or unintentionally, in all but name, be appropriating the celestial real estate by proxy of the private appropriation of their citizens. If they exercise jurisdiction and control over their citizens, they also exercise jurisdiction jurisdiction and control over the citizens' celestial real estate. If this happens, the prohibition in Article 2 is once again triggered and as such means that private appropriation of celestial real estate is impossible since it cannot be severed from the applicable supervision and control and jurisdiction of the nation state. Since sovereignty is based on, amongst other things, territory, appropriation of territory by a private person while unacceptable. Finally, I now answer the question posed in the beginning. Yes, the non-appropriation principle is still relevant and should remain a guiding principle for the development of space law, while at the same time recognizing the need for continuous development and reinterpretation as needed. I thank you for your attention and look forward to some questions. Thank you, Major Omji. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Erlank, for your research presentation, uh, for all your thoughts on this important topic today. You raised um, a number of uh, interesting points about law and property in outer space, uh, which I'm sure will spur some discussion. And we're glad that you could be with us today, uh, despite being a continent away, uh, and glad that there weren't any of the rolling blackouts uh, that sometimes uh, you mentioned happened in, in South Africa. So glad everything uh, worked out and the stars aligned today. Um, at this point, uh, we'll turn to questions from attendees. Um, so anyone can add questions if you've been holding on to them. Uh, just tap those, try type those into the Q and A box, and uh, we'll pose those questions, time permitting. Uh, let's see, we've gotten a few questions already. Um, one of them uh, for you, Professor Erlunk, is uh, you had mentioned the U.S. Um, uh, uh, Resource Exploitation Act from 2015. Um, that's been mimicked by a few other states uh, like UAE and Luxembourg, um, and I think most recently by Japan. Um, and the question, it's kind of a two-part question, I'll just pose the first one for now, is do you think that will be a continuing trend and other states will follow uh, in, in the footsteps of these early states? Yes, uh, thank you, that, that's a great question. And I, I'm quite certain about this. I, I don't even need to look into a crystal ball. Uh, I mean, we, we saw the snowball effect taking off immediately after uh, it was enacted in the US. And I think the thinking was at that stage, listen, the US is taking a position on this. They were able to frame it uh, in such a way as to not um, go against international space law. So they, they were talking about exploiting a loophole. And I think um, everyone thought, well, it, it's the same as, as, for example, the width of railway tracks. You know, the first person decides how, how big a railway track has to be. And anyone else who wants to come in afterwards just have to accept that and, and use it as they find it. So I think the current thinking is that if uh, if states are not going to um, allow for their citizens to be able to exploit space resources and eventually uh, 
get ownership of such extracted resources and the whole question about exploitation of course it is a contentious one as well mm -hmm. but i think states will not be uh will not want to be left behind and that is possibly also a reason why uh no i can't remember who just uh removed themselves from from the moon agreement uh but Saudi Arabia. It, it's Saudi Arabia, yes. So, so they've got, got this developing space program. And I think they also said, like, like we're not going to tie us down with this. Let's, uh, let, let's create the possibilities. So indeed, I, I think that we'll see more of this in the future. Mm -hmm. Part two of that same question was, do you think there's really any legal effect to these um, domestic laws being passed in different states? Um, I know, for example, the US provision says you can go out there if you can reach an asteroid and mine it and bring things back to the earth, then you own them, you can sell them. Um, however, I think the last clause says something all consistent with international law. And so some people have argued, well, the Space Act is uh, basically encouragement to the, the private industry to develop and, and go out there, but uh, you can't supersede uh, a treaty provision. Um, so in your opinion, do these domestic laws really have any, any true legal effect? You know, on, on one hand, I think they, they do have, at the very least, if you've got a large economy. So if the U.S. says they will allow and recognize a U.S. citizen to bring back space resources to the U.S., and they will accept that such resources can be sold inside the U.S. I mean, this is a, a sovereignty thing. Uh, technically, we might say that this is in, in breach of international law. Although, I mean, the loopholes exist there. And as soon as the market is created, even if, if they cannot sell it outside of, of the domestic territory, I think that, that we will see a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the, the same thing I think will happen. They, there's often talk about uh, international common law that says at least Articles 1 to 4 of the OST uh, has reached uh, a status of having international common law. But I think we will see that emerging practice will create a new common law or customary law uh, where other nations will just follow. And I think to a large extent, it will be something along the lines of everyone expected that when Mir uh, was first launched into outer space, uh, other jurisdictions would protest about the overflying of their territory. But nobody said a word. Everyone just accepted it because they could see how this would benefit themselves. And I think to a large degree, we will see pretty much the same thing happening now. And even if it is a breach of international law, which I'm not sure it is, uh, the way that the US has phrased the fact that they will allow their own citizens to do this, but it is uh, in terms of international law, creates a, a, a very big market for this to happen. And the fact that the ISL in their opinion piece also said, well, we don't like this, but we cannot find fault with it. I think that was one of the instances that, that paved the way for more acceptance of this in the future. Perfect. Um, I see that we have about two minutes, so maybe we can squeeze in one more question. Uh, another person asked about micro taking. So for example, small samples from the moon for scientific purposes and how really no states have any issue with that, especially if it's a small sample and it's really for scientific purposes. Where do we cross the line though when we start to take more from the moon, whether it's for scientific purposes or otherwise? At what point do we start to actually diminish the moon or use and, uh, and take away actual parts of the moon that, that you could appreciate uh, where we could say, okay, actually now you're, you're, you're appropriating part of the moon in violation of article two of the outer space treaty. Yeah, I think if we look at, at the, the, the freedoms or the principles contained in the outer space treaty and one of the, the biggest ones, of course, that it's to be for the benefit of all of mankind. But the other one is that there has to be free access for, amongst other things, exploration. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a, it's a very big philosophical question whether you can have any sort of exploration without having an effect on the environment. And I don't think you can. Uh, 
So indeed, we have really benefited from quite a number of space uh, related things that have been developed. Uh, we have benefited from uh, knowledge generated by these microsamples brought back to Earth. And maybe one day NASA is able to open that nice container that they brought back. But uh, I think the, the focus here should be that, that we must accept that humans are a polluting species, that we interfere with the environment, but we're also part of the environment. And that any form of interaction that we do will have an effect on the environment, but we must try and do it to such a degree that it doesn't create too much of an issue. So the generation of knowledge, the, the sharing of knowledge from samples brought back to earth is very important. Such knowledge must not be kept uh, for the benefit of only the, the nation bringing it back, but it should be shared widely. Of course, you can't share everything, but uh, yeah, I think as we explore, uh, we will definitely have to figure these things out. And uh, on the other hand, things that are held in commons, even if they are in commons, somebody has to supervise this. And I don't know who is going to do the supervision. I am certainly not convinced that it will be the UN or that they are the best to do so. Thank you. Um, seeing that we're at the top of the hour, uh, I think it's a good time to wrap up for the day. I want to sincerely thank uh, Dr. Erlunk for his time. Uh, thank you for sharing your research with us and answering a number of questions. I also want to thank everyone uh, who tuned in. Thank you for your attendance uh, as usual. We have uh, several more exciting speakers lined up for this academic year. So please keep tuning in for our uh, space law webinars and have a great day, everyone. Thank you again and see you next time. Thank you.